delighted, delighted to have family represented here and really delighted to see so many people who you joined touch your life in so many ways, maybe directly through Gunnison Baptist Church, you were a part of the church family here. Um, great to see Michael and others, Michael Press from UFM. Michael, where were you over, over there? Michael, thank you for coming from UFM. Um, that mission work that Doreen has such a heart for. Um, we really appreciate your presence with us. Um, and whatever you are linked with her, it's great to see you. I hope you can stay um, afterwards and enjoy your tea together. There are some photo books and things, um, some memories. And what we're doing today, it's not a funeral, it, it's not a committal of uh, mortal remains, that's not something we're doing here. That has taken place in Zimbabwe. Um, maybe some of you were able to join the Zoom to see the family meeting there. Um, some of us did that, and I said to Andy earlier, I said, well, we loved following the Zoom, occasionally it glitched out, or we got kicked out, let's go back in. There was one point where Andrew was speaking and he said this. He said, Mum did not bear any grudges except when she had to appear in court. At which point the connection went <laughs> <laughs> and he left us tantalisingly not knowing what happened when she had to appear in court and the grudge that she bore. And I really hope, Andrew, that we're going to hear the answer to that question. <laughs> Well, then, on behalf of uh, Chris, uh, Maggie, um, myself, and Mum's family, uh, thank you all for being here. Some of you have come quite a distance. Uh, thank you also to Tim and to Janet for catering, and to Christine for stepping up uh, into, uh, to play uh, uh, the piano, and to other church members uh, who have put a lot of time and effort uh, to prepare for this remembrance. Well, um, also, I should just say thanks to God's really, uh, to, to uh, Chiswick Baptist for providing uh, us with the venue. Well, many of you knew mine uh, for many, many years, uh, although I doubt many of you uh, were here when she first attended Gunsbury, an incredible 72 years ago. <laughs> Gunsbury was a spiritual home and was her extended family. It was where she was married where she returned to after her husband's death, and where she devoted herself to until her last year. But like the Queen, she lived uh, to see many ministers coming and going. <laughs> but unlike the Queen, she loved them all. <laughs> when she told the previous minister uh, several years ago that she wanted to give her body to science when she died, she said, shame. We were hoping to embalm you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, put you in a glass cabinet at the front of the church. <laughs> but neither is possible, of course. Uh, she died in Zimbabwe at my sister Maggie's uh, house with her family by her side. So our family are spread uh, between the two continents, um, three in fact, but we were able to have a service uh, in Harare with Maggie and Chris and other members of the family out, out there. Uh, we've received many letters uh, and cards of condolences from all over the world, and it's been a, a reminder of how many people she was a friend to experience <coughs> influence. So Janice is going to speak on behalf of Gunnersbury, so my small tribute is going to be from a family perspective, uh, with a little about her younger life uh, before many of you knew her. So Mark was born uh, back in 1930, and despite a childhood uh, that included the war when the family were evacuated to Norfolk and the Malvern Hills um, uh, to escape the, the bombs falling on London, she had a, a very carefree upbringing with her 12 siblings, yes, 12. Uh, my grandfather's first wife died after having seven children. <coughs> Mum was number 12, and by the time she was born, her eldest sister was already at medical school. Incidentally, Mum is the, the last of the 13 uh, to die, uh, the generation uh, passed on. Mum was a very cheerful child, uh, was sometimes nicknamed Blue Eyes, 
all his 13 children, she may have been the favourite of her father. <coughs> I'm sure my cousins might uh, disagree with that. <coughs> so Mum's life was profoundly characterised by her strong and determined faith. And it was in her family that her faith was forged. So the Harris family never missed uh, the twice on Sunday chapel services. Uh, Mum's mother grew up in a strict denomination where they had a tuning fork to keep the, get the right pitch before the hymns uh, because all the music was frowned upon. One of Mum's jokes, and she had many, and the jokes really were the equivalent of dad jokes, um, perhaps reflected her upbringing in a, dust, in a distrust of arm waving and emotional displays in services or anywhere else for that matter. How does the preacher in a Pentecostal church ask who would like coffee? Those who want coffee, put your arms down. <laughs> so in her family, there was a very strong sense of Christian vocation and mission many family members becoming missionaries. But mum first did a degree in physical education to become a PE teacher. She was very good at tennis and hockey. She promised my brother Chris his own tennis racket uh, when he could beat her in a match, which I understand didn't happen uh, until he was well into his teens. But mum then retrained as a physiotherapist at St. Thomas's Hospital on the river from here. When I asked her why she had changed, she said the teacher training course was going to be all girls, but she didn't like the idea of that. <laughs> <laughs> but when she first went to the Christian Union at St. Thomas's, she opened the door to find herself confronted with a room full of very tall men. She turned around and hurried home. <laughs> but her courage returned, and one of those tall men turned out to be a medical student called John Sharp, who fell instantly for the slim, pretty girl. So their letters to each other during their engagement, which mum kept all her life, uh, show our father besotted, and mum certainly very much in love, but also cool-headed and determined that her would-be husband would share her sense of mission. Incidentally, whilst a physiotherapist, um, she appeared in an early black and white BBC TV program instructing pregnant women how to garden. <laughs> yes, and a pastime she took absolutely no interest in. Then so after they were married, uh, Mum and Dad did the training and went as missionaries to southwest Uganda in East Africa, where John had grown up and where his parents uh, had built up had built up leprosy care in the region. There they started the CZ Hospital in a few broken down build buildings at the head of a remote valley. So from a comfortable background in a pretty well-to-do family in what was still the capital city of an empire, it was canvas camp beds in the dust with sand fleas and with little privacy. Building up and running the hospital was a stupendous and um, joint undertaking, an all-consuming task. The site had to be purchased, buildings pulled down and put up, bricks fired, furniture made, water supply uh, piped in from a spring, electricity generated from a water chute off a nearby waterfall, uh, medical equipment and drugs sourced, uh, staff recruited and trained, and the language learned, although John could speak uh, pretty fluently as they'd grown up in the region. Patients arrived immediately in huge numbers. Mum was also, of course, giving birth to and looking after her children. John designed and supervised the building of our own house and with money very short, moulded our bath out of concrete. <laughs> I enjoyed peeling the paint off it when I was in the bath as a youngster. <laughs> so Kasizi is their most enduring and wide-reaching physical legacy as it came and is a training hospital with a fantastic reputation. Uh, started by John and Doreen, it's extraordinary. It has touched many lives, not only in the regional communities, but in other parts of Uganda, and many other countries around the world. When we took Mum back to the 50th anniversary of the hospital, she was guest of honour, and the President of Uganda presented her with a portrait of Dad, uh, who had treated him when he was a herd boy. But that anniversary was far in the future. Whilst it was easy as the hospital was being developed and expanded, and we were working harder than ever, John became very ill with a rare cancer, and despite surgery at the hospital he had trained in, uh, he died aged 35, a 
nearly four years after they were married. So Mum was left with three children, aged 10, 8 and 6. And I um, well remember attending Gunsbury on a Sunday morning, just two hours after being told uh, the news of Dad's death. Mum was not going to change the routine. Life and the work must continue. So Dad's death tested Mum's character with fire. She came out of that with um, two steely and equal purposes. Firstly, she would continue in missionary work, whatever was needed. And she had her own strong ideas on what was needed. Uh, there's a letter from her to the Mission Council telling them what they should decide she should do. <laughs> she stayed on in Uganda, a place we called home, for another three years, uh, working with uh, young people. Before returning to work at the Randall Mission headquarters in London, and then later in Redcliffe Mission Training College and Red Sea Mission. She was also a long standing council member of the Anaheim July Fields Mission, interviewing candidates and keeping touch with and encouraging uh, many UFN missionaries. She continued to support CESI in any way she could, and Mum also ran a popular Bible club in, uh, for, for neighbours' children in Act 2. But it was, of course, to us the children. Uh, that she also devoted herself after Dan's death. It would be tempting for a suddenly widowed uh, young woman uh, to become overprotective of her young children, but she would trust in what she insisted was God's overruling in all things, whatever was to happen. In practice, this meant she gave us an absolute secure home, a rock of love and care that was always there, but without restricting our freedom. Some of us use that freedom more freely than others. <laughs> oh my, my sister up here today. <laughs> she was always available uh, to us uh, without being overbearing. Uh, she listened when we needed to listen to and backed off when we needed space, for example, between the ages of 13 and 17. <laughs> uh, she was encouraging to herself in all we did and generous in her praise and of our achievements. Even when they were totally outside the world, she had grown up in uh, a new herself. As a mother, she was buoyant, cheerful, laughed easily, uh, was enthusiastic for her projects, and adventurous. Being a single parent did not stop her taking us by ship back from East Africa, travelling across Europe by train, or going on holiday to Scotland, Austria, or Devon, in a tiny piece of a car called the Hillman Inn. I think the Hillman name was a code for being you pushed up hills by a man. <laughs> so when we returned as a family from Uganda, my grandmother and extended family uh, helped her financially and we were able to live in a flat in my grandmother's house. Mum welcomed hundreds of visitors, particularly those in need in one way or another, uh, to our homes both in Uganda and in the UK. We often had guests at our table. Perhaps this is an example that's rubbed, that's rubbed off on all of us uh, her children with the help of our spouses. Mum, um, contrary to uh, uh, Tim's uh, introduction to my mother's criminal career, uh, <laughs> Mum did not bear grudges. <laughs> Even when she had to appear in court, um, when falsely accused by a police officer of doing 80 miles an hour on the road, <laughs> it wasn't in, in fact until she was in the 80s. Should have been stopped by the police. <laughs> <laughs> and um, only her demolition of a wall and the front of her house stopped her from driving. <laughs> when we were young, uh, Mum did not hesitate to get help from those who felt sorry for the widow. Whether it was asking for someone to ship a giant crate containing a family heirloom back to the UK from Uganda at their own expense, or ringing a professor she knew at the medical school before my interview for that medical school. <laughs> Surprise, I got in. <laughs> Too late now to report it to the General Medical Council. <laughs> she never complained, ever, whether it was the um, death of her young husband or her very hard last years. A year ago, when I expressed my sympathy uh, to her about her losing her sight and her mobility, she said, Oh well, if God lets you live this long, you just have to grin and bear it. <laughs> well, there's several more to say, but uh, perhaps just this as a family, we shall miss greatly her constancy. Absolutely. 
absolute constancy in love and kindness and faith. Those have always been there to all our lifetimes, of course, but now she's gone. But that legacy of love and kindness and faith has not been. Uh, you see it reflected back, living on in her family, including all her wonderful 11 grandchildren, who gave their own moving tributes um, by video when we had our service in uh, Zimbabwe. And just to say, finally, finally, that there are some pictures from Mum's life on the table uh, or on the, um, the board uh, outside. Thank you. The college was in Grove Park on the edge of the Thames with beautiful grounds. And whilst I worked alongside Dory, Hannah spent time in her pram in the garden, or being looked after by the students, so quite an idyllic first couple of years. In 2005, Dory asked Barry what he would be doing in his long school summer holiday, and whether he might have time to help some friends of hers with a few practical jobs. He agreed and then asked where they lived, assuming Chiswick or Ely. Oh, in Mongolia, replies <laughs> And so began a friendship with our now global mission partners, Mark and Jill Newman. Dory was always a stalwart for prayer, and in the late 80s, many of the congregation were encouraged to pray regularly by name for children in Sunday school and the youth group. Hannah and a few others were allocated to Dory, and over the years, we are aware that she prayed regularly for them, for which we, for which we have always been grateful. Doreen cared for so many in the church, and was always willing to offer a lift to those in need. Recognising that perhaps her driving days were coming to an end, <laughs> I offered to give someone a lift on her behalf, and her reply, Thank you, my dear, but this is still one thing I'm able to do. <laughs> Fortunately, God knew best, and Doreen's driving was brought to an abrupt end in the porch at her front door. Not willing to be dependent on lifts, <coughs> frequently asked Barry whether the battery in her mobility scooter would get her to church and back. <laughs> Accepting that this would not be possible, we and many others were able to give her lifts and benefit from her conversations on the way. During a conversation about grandchildren and great-grandchildren, Doreen was delighted when it transpired that her great her great grandson would be attending the primary school in Vista, where our son-in-law Matt's mum is the head teacher. To see her body become so frail was sad to see, but her mind was still very alert. On one conversation I had with her earlier this year, she told me she was leaving the home in Leicester to go to Zimbabwe to be with Maggie. I admit I did not take it seriously, but when she repeated this on another occasion, I texted Marietta to see whether Doreen was beginning to be confused. Not at all. Arrangements were in hand and she was travelling with Maggie and her granddaughter to Zimbabwe at the end of February. And that was me told. Never underestimate Doreen. <laughs> We were sad knowing that we would not see her again. We'd wanted to visit her in Leicester, but COVID and a broken hip prevented this. But we're delighted that she was able to return to her beloved Africa and spend time with Maggie and her family. In our loss, we just give thanks that Doreen is now with her Lord, whom she has faithfully served for so many years. She often said she would not see the completion of the building project. And she was right. <laughs> but there will always be a memory of Doreen Sharp at Gunsford. Well, we're going to take a moment to pray. We have so much to thank the Lord for, don't we? Whenever we see the grace of God in our life, we don't praise that person. We trace the blessings back up, back up Sunday to the source. Nigel Edwards is going to come and join me. I'm going to lead off this prayer. Nigel will particularly pray a moment for Doreen's. Um, lead on mission work at Gunnersbury, and care for that. Um, but let's give thanks and pray for other things as well. Patrick, do you want to come and stand here? If you will?
Our Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you. We thank you for all that we've heard, which is just a tip of an iceberg of blessing. Thank you, Father, for the, the family that you put Doreen in. Thank you that she was able to grow up, not just in a large family, but in a family where Jesus was held up as being life's answer, life's solution, and where that was not only spoken of, but lived. Father, we thank you for her own family that were around her, for her parents, for her siblings. We thank you for blessing her with marriage. Well, from our perspective, that seems so short and not to plan. And yet we trust, as we've heard in her own words, your overruling, your sovereignty in those things. And we thank you that that marriage was, um, was your plan and your work. Thank you for the family that you brought through that marriage. Thank you for the partnership that they had, for the love that they shared, for the work that came to fruition there at Kazizi, the hard work, the service that they were able to, to do together there. And thank you for sustaining Doreen through really dark days where we can easily see it could have been so different. Thank you that you stood alongside her and you strengthened her. And Father, thank you so much for that clear focus, that clear focus for her children to give them the upbringing that they needed, but also that clear focus on the need for our world to hear the good news of Jesus. We give you thanks for these things in his name. Amen. Amen. We do thank you, our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, for this little dedication to serve you and for the love for you, a love for which you took every opportunity to share with us. Thank you, Lord, so much for all that Dorian was and did for you at Gunsbury. That was such a long membership of the church, she was always keen and ready to encourage us, her fellow church members, to reach out to others, particularly those in other countries. Thank you, Lord, for Doreen's leadership of the church's global mission committee, set up by her and chaired by her for so many years. We thank you that through her encouragement and determination, she established initial contact with more than one of our current mission partners. We thank you most of all, Lord, for Doreen's modelling of a life of service to you, and for that service being carried out with real love and care for others. And for the inspiration that she has been to so many within and outside Gunsbury. Hers truly was a Christian life well lived, and we thank you so much that she is now in your nearer presence, rejoicing in that far better life. That life offered to all those who, through your all-surpassing grace, have turned to you for salvation and come to know you and are therefore eternally members of your family. Amen. Amen. One says, as a relatively late one to Christianity, saved in 1986 at the age of 33, Dorian was one of the first and major encouragers to me and a teacher of life, life's lessons. She once asked me to do something. I can't recall what it was now. But I said, yes, sure, I'll do that, Doreen. A month or so passed and the task had slipped from my mind. Doreen gave me a little nudge and said, and I said, oh yes, sorry, I'll get it done. But another month or so had passed and I still hadn't done it, even though it was niggling with it. You know the feeling. That need to get something done and not quite able to fit it in. So Doreen asked me again, have I done it? Uh, sorry, sorry, Doreen, not yet. <laughs> Now, Doreen was gracious, and she said to me, Ron, you know the scripture tells us what we promised to do, we should do. <laughs> <laughs> so strange to be between your idea, Ron. 
how that stuck with me. Doreen hit the spot. The next day I carried out the task. <laughs> the word stuck with me more than what the nature of the task was. Um, come on, I'll read that, another little section just about a question. You heard that question to Barry. Oh, bit of time in the summer holiday? Well, here's a question to Ron. Asked in the hallway as she was leaving a Bible study, Ron, would you consider becoming involved in the mission support at Gunnersbury? Uh, Ron says, well, I was quite concise and said, I'm sorry, Doreen, but I don't have the slightest interest in missions. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doreen's a great prayer warrior, and I'm sure she went to work on it. But some few years later, I did indeed become involved in mission support. Christine Stroud has a shared missionary background with Doreen and had a lot in common. Christine's playing the piano today. Um, and also shared boarding school that you both went to. Um, and Clarendon School's motto was non ministrari sed ministre. Not to be served, but to serve. From Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man has not come to be ministered to or to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And as Christine puts it, Doreen's service was a wonderful reflection of this. I think it does describe her really well. It wasn't about being served. It was about serving others. Very evident in the sacrificial life lived for Christ. She continues to be a challenge and example to me and her wise counsel I hold very dear. Lord, but you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O oh Lord my God, I cry to you for help, and you have healed me. O oh Lord, you brought up my soul from shield. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, but his favour is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favour, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Well, what you have before you is a song that meant a lot to Dory, particularly in this past year or so. How would you define life, its purpose, its potential? How about this, which I think is the emphasis of this psalm? <coughs> the possibility of life being a song of praise to our Maker and our Savior. The possibility of life being a song of praise to God. In the original language, in verse 1 and verse 12, the, the very first word and the very last word, they both speak of praise. That's what it's about. And it's about God. You can see the word Lord there ten times in this psalm because all of life is about him. He, verse 1, is the one who rescues from death, who draws us up, who heals, verse 2, who restores to life, verse 3, brings up from the pit. He is the one who shows his favour in verse 7, and that is, is good. And when that goes and he hides his face, it's fearful. Now there is anger in there, you may have noticed, in verse 5. 
but far more references to his favour. Favor. But anyway, who wants a God who is indifferent towards evil? This God is not. And he's a God who wants us to come to him for the help that we need. O oh Lord, verse 10, be my helper. What a helper God is. It's also a psalm about the human experience. Look at verses 1 to 3. There's some sort of rescue from the jaws of death. An illness, perhaps, the word healed is there in verse 2. Have you ever thought that life is coming to an end? Maybe you're here today and actually you look back and you think, I wouldn't have expected to be here. Doreen had an experience like that. You know her trip to Zimbabwe um, a few years ago. She was in her 80s and she was on the plane and turbulence hit. If you've heard her description of that journey, she and I think most of the people on the plane thought that was it. Being pulled out of death. Then there's the encouragement from God in verses 4 to 5 that this psalmist has to, to others. He calls the saints, he calls us to, to praise the Lord, to give thanks to him. In verses 6 and 7 there seems to be some sort of complacency. We can be like that, can't we? We can think, oh, um, I've got things sorted. Seems to be some sort of pride that seeps in and a loss of God's presence, or at least the sense of God's presence, that the psalmist, I think, needs to repent of. In verses 8 to 10, there's his appeal, his appeal to God. Notice what his appeal is based on in verse 9. It's not just based on him and his own happiness, it's based on God's name and God's praise. Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness if I go down to the pit? And there's a final burst of joy in verses 11 and 12. Um, I say final, I think literally it is final. I will give thanks to you forever. It doesn't end. Suffering is real. Sin is real, the psalm says. But when we find our helper in God, all is bright. And even this life may be a song of praise to him. So we see a lot about God and the human experience here. We also see a contrast that I want to just uh, focus this in on in verse 5. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. What's being contrasted here? Weeping, of course, and joy. And the night is contrasted with the morning. The night. It assumes that life has something of the night about it. It has sickness. It has weeping. It has, verse 11, the, the morning word is wailing. Maybe that feels very relevant for you at the moment. Now the language of the weeping may tarry for a night is rather lovely. It's the word is literally it's like a lodger who comes as a short-term guest, not the sort of guest you want, this weeping. But they're only present briefly. They tarry for the night, and by daybreak there is no God. They're a short-term lodger. That's the weeping. It's there for the night. And in the place of that lodger, a new visitor arrives. Well, not really a visitor, because this visitor stays. Joy. We know it stays because the end of the psalm says, I will give thanks to you forever. So this night is contrasted, this, this short-term night is contrasted with this eternal morning. Night characterised by the weeping day, morning by joy. Now, Doreen, Doreen valued that verse. Why? Was it just a, a nice bit of wishful thinking for her to hold on to? These are actually empty words without 
the gospel of Jesus Christ being true. But actually, it's based on a real night and a real morning in history. The night of the cross and the morning of the resurrection. We're going to sing in a few minutes about the night of the cross. Um, you'll see in our final song it says, Because the sinless Saviour died. If you and I really understood what that meant, we would see that as the worst night, the blackest, the most horrible thing. And yet to draw sinners up from this pit, the Bible tells us that Christ has climbed into it. And he has experienced this night. That night may only tarry with you. For the short term, rather than being your permanent lodger. So there's the real night that this is based on, and that we need to base this on, otherwise it is just empty words. But there's also the real morning, the resurrection morning, when sorrow was turned to joy. Who said to Eeyore? Good morning, Eeyore. To which Eeyore says, if it is a good morning, which I doubt, resurrection morning really is a good morning, Eeyore. Because Jesus said, in advance of it, he said, you will have sorrow now, the night, the temporary night, the lodger tarrying briefly. But I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice, and get this, no one will take away your joy. There's the permanent guest. For all who follow him, joy comes with Christ, and joy stays. Charles Spurgeon, his name I think is on one of the stones of this church said that easy roads make sleepy travellers. And we've heard today, Doreen's road was not easy, was it? And she certainly was not a sleepy traveller for long ago. She knew that night. She knew the reality of that night. And it probably didn't feel short-term at the time. Back when she lost John, also more recently as she faced old age. But now there is only mourning. Um, just to be clear, mourning without the you, not the sad mourning, the happy mourning. Only this joy. There's a bit in the first series of The Crown <coughs> I really love because the young queen, maybe you've seen it in the first series, she's preparing for the coronation. And she, she wanted to practice wearing the crown because it's very heavy and you need to get used to it. Um, and she said to whoever it was there in the palace, she said, can I borrow it? In other words, can I take it away from it and, and, and practice with it? Can I borrow it? To which the reply was, borrow it, ma'am. If it's not yours, <laughs> whose is it? <laughs> It's not borrowed anymore. It's not short term anymore. It's not here and then gone. Borrow it, man. It's not yours. Whose is it? And verse 4 is the call, I think, to us today. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. I don't want, and I know for sure that Dorian would not want this to be an impersonal look at the Bible. She'd want us all, wouldn't she, to be challenged by God's word today? Are you responding to that call? Is your life at all looking like 
a song of praise to the Lord? If Doreen's life did not challenge you in some way, then I suggest you didn't know that that well, but I think anyone who did, you'll know her life was a challenge. Hannah, who read the psalm, said about Doreen, when she heard verse 5 again, as Hannah comforted her with those words through difficult times in the last few months, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Doreen said, that's wonderful. It's just what I need. That's what you and I need now as well. 